Now this brings us to the sorts of moves that people are apt to make in the moral sphere. Okay. Consider the great problem of women's bodies. What to do about them? Well, this is one thing you can do about them. You can cover them up. Now, it is the position, generally speaking, of our intellectual community that, well, we might not like this. We might think of this as wrong in Boston or Palo Alto. Who are we to say that the proud denizens of an ancient culture are wrong to force their wives and daughters to live in cloth bags? I mean, who are we to say even that they're wrong to beat them with lengths of steel cable or throw battery acid in their faces if they decline the privilege of being smothered in this way? Okay, well, who are we not to say this? Who are we to pretend that we know so little about human well-being that we have to be non-judgmental about a practice like this? I'm not talking about voluntary wearing of a veil. I mean, women should be able to wear whatever they want, as far as I'm concerned. But what does voluntary mean in a community where when a girl gets raped, her father's first impulse, rather often, is to murder her out of shame? Just let that fact detonate in your brain for a minute. Your daughter gets raped, and what you want to do is kill her. What, what are the chances that represents a peak of human flourishing? Now, to say this is not to say that we have got the, the, the perfect solution in our own society. I mean, for instance, this is what it's like to go to a newsstand almost anywhere in the civilized world. Now, granted, for many men, it may require a degree in philosophy to see something wrong with these images. <laughs> but if we are in a reflective mood, we can ask, is this the perfect expression of psychological balance with respect to variables like youth and beauty and women's bodies? I mean, is this the optimal environment in which to raise our children? Probably not. OK, so, so perhaps there's some place on the spectrum between these two extremes that represents a place of, of, of better balance. Okay. But perhaps, perhaps there are many such places. I mean, again, given other changes in human culture, there may be many peaks on the moral landscape. But the thing to notice is that there'll be many more ways not to be on a peak. Now, the irony, from my perspective, is that the only people who seem to generally agree with me and who think that there are right and wrong answers to moral questions are religious demagogues of one form or another. And of course, they think they have right answers to moral questions because they got these answers from a voice in a whirlwind. Okay, not because they made an intelligent analysis of the causes and condition of, of, of human and animal well-being. And in fact, the, the, the endurance of religion as a, as a lens through which most people view moral questions has separated most moral talk from real questions of human and animal suffering. I mean, this is why we spend our time talking about things like gay marriage and not about genocide or nuclear proliferation or poverty or any other hugely consequential issue. But the, the, the demagogues are right about one thing. We need a universal conception of human values. Now, what stands in the way of this? Well, one thing to notice is that we, we do something different when talking about morality, especially secular academic scientist types. When talking about morality, we value differences of opinion in a way that we don't in any other area of our lives. So for instance, the Dalai Lama gets up every morning meditating on compassion, and he thinks that helping other human beings is an integral component of human happiness. Yeah. On the other hand, we have someone like Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was very fond of abducting and raping and torturing and killing young women. Okay, so we appear to have a genuine difference of opinion about how to profitably use one's time. Okay. <laughs> Most Western intellectuals look at this situation and say, well, there's nothing for the Dalai Lama to be really right about, really right about, or for Ted Bundy to be really wrong about that admits of a... Uh, of a real argument that, that, that potentially falls within the purview of science. Okay, that we, you know, he likes chocolate, he likes vanilla, there's, there's, no, there's nothing that one should be able to say to the other that should persuade the other. 
Now notice that we don't do this in science. On the left you have Edward Witten. He's a string theorist. If you ask the smartest physicists around, who's the smartest physicist around, in my experience, half of them will say Ed Witten. The other half will tell you they don't like the question. <laughs> <clears throat> so, what would happen if I showed up at a physics conference and said string theory is bogus? You know, it doesn't resonate with me. It's not how I choose to view the universe at the smallest scale. I'm not a fan. Okay, well, <laughs> well, nothing would happen because I'm not a physicist. I don't understand string theory. I I'm the Ted Bundy of string theory. Okay? <clears throat> I wouldn't want to belong to any string theory club that would have me as a member. Okay, but this is just the point. Okay, whenever we are talking about facts, Certain opinions must be excluded. That is what it is to have a domain of expertise. That is what it is for knowledge to count. How have we convinced ourselves that in the moral sphere there is no such thing as moral expertise or moral talent or moral genius even? How have we convinced ourselves that every opinion has to count? How have we convinced ourselves that, that every culture has a point of view on these subjects worth considering? Does, does the Taliban have a point of view on physics that is worth considering? No. Okay. How, is, how is their ignorance, how is their ignorance any less obvious on the subject of human well-being? So, so this, I, I think, is what the world needs now. It needs people like ourselves to admit that there are right and wrong answers to questions of human flourishing. And morality relates to that domain of facts. It is possible for individuals and even for whole cultures to care about the wrong things. Which is to say it's possible for them to have beliefs and desires that reliably lead to needless human suffering. Just admitting this will transform our discourse about morality. Okay, we, we live in a, in, a, in a world in which the boundaries between nations mean less and less and they will one day mean nothing. We live in a world filled with destructive technology and this technology cannot be uninvented. It, it will always be easier to break things than to fix them. Okay, it seems to me therefore patently obvious that we can no more respect and tolerate vast differences in, in notions of human well-being, then, then we can respect or tolerate vast differences in the notions about how disease spreads or in the, in the safety standards of buildings and airplanes. We simply must converge on the answers we give to the most important questions in human life. And to do that, we have to admit that these questions have answers. Thank you very much. <laughs>